The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Superwoman Wellness, where you know I am determined to bring you back to your superpowered self. Now, joining me today is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I don't really share a lot of my personal story with you guys because I want you guys to be better, not bore you with my story. But as many of you might know, I am of Muslim origin. And in that, there's a lot tied up with women's rights and women's equality and what sort of my mother went through and her mother went through and all of that other good stuff. And so what's been happening in Afghanistan and what's been happening in other parts of the world kind of touches my heart pretty deeply. So that's the reason we've brought on a very special guest and she is taking a risk even to be here with us. But I want to introduce you to Susie Kanu. She is CEO of Khalil bin Ebrahim Kanu Company, an international motor trading agency. And she is one of the most successful female business leaders in Bahrain and one of the top CEOs in the Arab world. Goodness gracious, congratulations. She has chosen to use her influence to advocate for the empowerment of Arab women and worldwide awareness of the need for legislation to ensure their safety and their well being. She earned her MBA from Harvard Business School. She then returned home to take charge of the automotive section of the family business with blessings from her father. Within six years, her division was among the top five in the country for its industry. Superwoman for sure. She has traveled to the UN to Syria and visits refugee camps around the world twice each year. She's a proud mother of three and she's a sought after speaker, poet and author of Hear Us Speak, Letters from Arab Women. Welcome to the show, Susie. I am beyond thrilled and honored to have you on here. We just want to learn from you. We want to get educated. But I think as a group of women that very much believe in owning our power and, and really charting our destiny, we want to know how we can unite with Arab women and really be one family rather than a divided family across the globe. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Of course. So tell us about the book. So your book is Hear Us Speak. Letters from Arab Women. What inspired you to write that book? Where, what were you hoping for as, as you sort of took the time out to, to write all of that down? Um, it's a book that I never thought actually I was going to be a writer or to, to, to write actually, or the topic, I never thought I'd actually write about this topic. But after years of being in the, in the, in the business and moving up the ladder to become a CEO, um, I'd sit and have a lot of discussions with many different women and I'd sold many different things that actually happened to me. So um, I sat down, I thought about it after uh, about two years ago and I said, you know what? When Forbes asked, came to me and asked me to, um, to, to write about me, I said, can I write about the Arabic woman's plight? Mm. So um, this is what I thought I could do to make a difference. I wanted to make a difference for um, my daughter's generation and uh, for women in the Arab world. Things are, are moving in the Arab world for women. It is getting by far much better than what people think around the world it is. Mm -hmm. It isn't what maybe people, uh, there is a misconception that, 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 you know, that, that we're living in tents and we're completely submissive. And, and that really isn't true at all. Um, I'm fighting for people to respect women women's men mentality to respect their thoughts, to respect their ideas, and to have things on the table that we can talk about, basically. Uh, so in the book, what I've done is I have many chapters, and each chapter has an issue. Hmm. So one of the their interviews, I went all around the Arab world, and I had interviews with many women, and there are many more women, beautiful women that I met that aren't in the book. Mm -hmm. And everyone's anonymous, so they could speak a bit more freely with me. Right. And, um, and it was just touching. I thought the beginning I'd hear very depressing stories and some of them were traumatic, but women uh, rise above it. They're, they're beautiful, they're fantastic, they're strong if you allow them. And they're, they're just, uh, I was moved by everything I saw with them. And some women, you know, didn't make it. You know, some women mm -hmm. um, couldn't move away from what they were, what they were facing, which, which is natural and which is normal. But um, so I talked about different subjects. One of them was abuse which happens all around the world I mean yeah. this is not it's not just in the Arab world so right. I can't just say oh there's physical abuse in the Arab world but what I'm trying to say is what sort of legislation do we have in place where we can protect women better 
you know, um, this is what I'm trying to talk about. I know people are like, no, but we have it according to our religion. We have these things we have to follow through and we might. But when it comes to the legislation and the judges sitting, the woman seems to be the person who ends up suffering the mother the most, mm -hmm. the woman, the wife, the mother the most. So let us talk about these issues and let's talk about them openly. There, there, there's nothing wrong with discussing and we're, if we're fine with the status quo, then we're fine. But if we're not, let us talk about it. And, and what I felt, I think it's all around is, is women just need to, to, to how, do you say that? how do you say it, is to release the sense of shame. Yes. You know, I don't know if, if, if it makes sense, but the sense of shame, if we're abused, maybe it's our fault, you know, maybe we asked for it, you know, if something happens to us, you know, we chose to marry a man that our parents weren't happy with, and then we're abused. This is the result. It's our right. fault. So we can't about it. We feel shame, you know, okay. whether it's a sister asking her father, can I have something more um, in a company because I know what happens later that I end up having. We feel embarrassed. We feel shame. You know, we, we're continuously feeling shame, you know, so we shouldn't. We, we Trying to empower women to not think that way is what I wish we could do. And the other, uh, another very interesting topic, I think it's, it's, it's a very relevant topic, it's a very important topic, is why can a mother not give citizenship to her children? Mm. So a man, if he marries a foreign woman, will give citizen, is allowed to give citizenship to his children immediately. If a woman marries a foreign man, she is not allowed to give citizenship wow. to her children. And uh, this is in most of most of the Arab world. So why do they have reservations against this UN um, charter? So so what 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 is the problem? Why can't we? I'm not even calling it equality. It's just respect. Mm -hmm. Why can't? So they have children. So some a, a woman that that I interviewed had children, and uh, she married uh, a man from a neighboring country. And uh, he decided to divorce her after the, the, the horrible abuse that she went through. And he just, you know, and you, you can just divorce a woman by saying, you know, yeah. you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced. And then he files a paper and that's it. No questions are asked and there's no reason um, that needs to be given. So um, she has children. So the children end up with no citizenship, no rights, no driver's license, no ID. She can't, they can't go to hospital. They can't go to, uh, to get educated. Mm. They can't go so what happens to these children just because a mother cannot give children um, uh, citizenship so it's 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 very strange in the 21st century can this be possible the story of women for all women right not just arab women is still an unfolding and evolving story right part of why i'm so passionate about women finding their health and understanding their health is because women often you know compromise and compromise and compromise any race any religion any any region of the world you know we are sort of the sacrificial lambs culturally for whatever reasons and we ignore everything until everything falls apart that's typically what plays out for the majority of the of women and for me what was so eye opening is that you know i have this a couple of practices here in the states and we have women you know that are great means you know that come through the practice we've had celebrities that have come through the practice and then we've had people that just really believe in what i do come through the practice and then i turn around and i do you know kind of like a mission trip to africa a couple of years ago and i meet with those women who have the horrific stories of abuse and abandonment and children that they have to care for you know what is the most shocking thing to me is that the stories are the same. It's the same medical conditions. It's the same like top four or five concerns. It's the same fear for their families and concern about protecting their families. Whether you have a woman that's married to an incredibly powerful man that she needs to get away from, or you have a woman that is living in refugee camps, it's the same story. And so when it comes to the Arab world, I think where the story may change is because it feels like, or it appears, at least for those of us on the outside, that there are less options. There's less protection. There are le there are fewer advocates or allies in the world. Are we making too big of a generalization when we talk about the Arab world? Are we talking about all the countries in the Arab world? Are we talking about a few countries? You know, um, you know, are we being too broad, or do we really need to call it what it is? And we're talking about the Muslim world and its Sharia law and the laws of sort of 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 the countries that followed that particular law 
are where the problems occur. What would you say kind of back to that? In most of the Arab world, and most, I can't say all of it, we do follow the Sharia law when it comes to marriage and when it comes to um, your, your personal life, you know, divorces, marriage, inheritance. We, we do follow that, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, what I need to actually continuously say is that Islam has, has given women rights. You know, 1,400 years ago when women had no rights. So they gave her the right to even inherit, you know? At that mm-hmm. time, women didn't even inherit at that time. And I think that that's beautiful and that's wonderful. And, and the way Islam is taught is, is, is beautiful in most of the countries. It's beautiful that it tells you that, you know, we respect elders, we respect family, we respect all of that. This is true. Mm-hmm. But what I'm trying to say is it's, it's really hard to, um, to live that lifestyle in the 21st century. Yes. And if anyone tells you, oh, you can, they're delusional. It really is hard. You know, um, if you want to follow it completely, it's, it's very difficult. And so I'm not saying to change completely the laws. I'm saying amend them. Let's talk about it and let's get each law a bit better. Mm-hmm. If women are protected in the law, if a woman comes to an abused woman comes home, comes to the court and says, I've been abused horribly and she can prove it and she can show the judge, be a little bit, I'm not saying easier on her, but, but treat her like a victim mm-hmm. and protect her. Instead of saying, go back to the husband that's abused you, he's signed a waiver saying he's not going to abuse you anymore. Now, that doesn't always happen, but it, it happens. So we need, yes, we do need to have certain laws that do protect women a bit more. And the laws are becoming by far better right now. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, in the neighboring country, Saudi Arabia, the changes that are happening there are, are incredible. The mm-hmm. change our women, to be honest, from, from where to where we are right, right now, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but we're not there yet. I keep saying in the book, we're not there yet. We really still need a whole generation to change all of that. So how do we look at it? I think, first of all, women, again, should, should take this shame away and have no, you know, we're educated like men. We get better grades than men. We go to better yes, schools. <laughs> no, we do, right? Oh, yes. No. Why should we continuously feel shame, you know? And we right. just do. You know, it's just if you have a brother, they ask you, please, you know, not be submissive, but listen to him. He's a man in the family, you know. So, yes, but I also have thoughts. I also have, you know, have mine. So and, you you know, you sometimes need to stand up and say, I have thoughts and I would like to voice them. And it is changing. Look, I'll tell you something that's really funny. The end of the book, not funny, it it shocked me. Um, I I said the story in the book. Every time I met someone, I'd come back and I'd sit with my daughter. She's uh, what you could generation Z. Mm -hmm. So every time I sat with her, I came back and I'd say, Lara, you know, I met these most incredible women. You know, look at what I'm meeting. I admire them more than CEOs, by far much more than me. You know, if you've seen what they've gone through and how strong they are and what they're trying to do, I admired them so much. And she said, yes, I'm so happy you're giving women who would have otherwise been shadows a voice to speak. Mm. And I'm so proud of you. And then I asked her to write me a letter and she did. And that letter made my mind work. And I said, you know what? I need to interview Generation Z. I need to know how they're thinking because we're thinking the way we're thinking. So I got them in a room, well, well, many in different countries and they all had the same, the same answers almost. And basically they said, change is coming and we're going to create this change. And that basically was the ending and change is coming. And, and we have, we don't carry the shame that you all carry. Right. We will stand, we'll talk and, and we, we don't have it. So that's incredible. So generation Z might be, might be, might the, be the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Maybe that's the answer. Maybe next generation, they're going to come up and stand up and not take no for an answer to anything. So it, there, there is something with social media that it is that is empowering the, this generation and I think um, they're standing up I mean when I talk to them about uh, about whether it was inheritance whether if your husband tells you you know you need to stay home with the kids because you know I don't work they said no we work we work together we raise kids we raise them together mm. and I asked them how they'd feel if their husband married another woman uh, or a third or fourth they said well this is uh, his issue we leave so mm-hmm. Their mentality is very different and they're very vocal about it. They're, wow. not, they're not silent. So this shocked me. And this was from many Arab countries around. It wasn't just one country. So they, they have a different mindset than, than we do. So is it the mind shift that we needed to have that's going on in this generation? I don't know. But, uh, you know, they've gotten this shame away. They've, got, they've taken, you know, n- not completely, but much less than we do. 
because I still felt it. You know, I went through, um, you know, I ran, I, I run companies, I'm the CEO, but I continuously had to prove myself to my mm-hmm. father. Mm-hmm. over you know i would get to the office at seven before the employees just to, just to be there before the employees right. you know just to say listen i'm i'm a hard worker i'm dedicated it's not just because he's my father so so i proved myself that way and i continuously till today you know i've been working for over 20 years and i still get to the office before my employees right. so I just continuously have to work harder than any i'm sure like i'm sure it's prevalent in all societies in all yeah. cultures we work harder than any man we know right so, um, so I don't, but I still had shame asking my father, you know, can I have this? Can I, I still felt, no, you know, I'm still the daughter. I still have right. to take a step back. Right. So I didn't want others to suffer in the same way. I wanted them to stand up and say, no, this is my right. If it's not my right, you need to give it to me because I deserve it. And we're talking about Arab women, but I'll tell you, it's women across the globe. I mean, I think, I mean, my husband and I actually had a really interesting conversation and he, we were talking about the housewife uh, versus working wife paradigm, you know, and he was saying he could see it from the male perspective, why a man would want a housewife, like all these things are taken care of, there's less chaos in the home, you know, think, you know, it's a little bit smoother, right, versus our lifestyle, right? Maybe he was giving me a hint, but you know, versus our lifestyle, where it's a little mad and a little crazy, but we've also been able to do amazing things and reach so many lives and it's work that I would never walk away from. But here is what I've seen in my exam rooms. And here's what I'm hearing when you speak. And this is the bridge and the commonality. This feeling of shame makes women sick. It makes them ill. It gives them anxiety. It gives them depression. It gives them issues with weight, hormone imbalances, uh, you name it. I have a list of autoimmune disease, eventually cancer. I have listened to the stories of so many women over the last 14 years. I get to spend a lot of time with people, which I'm so grateful for. But that is a commonality, this feeling of shame that women carry with them when they put themselves in any situation where they feel like they have to think twice before they ask for something or they have to like tiptoe around an issue or around a person or around a situation makes them ill and makes them sick. And I I get to see that from a medical standpoint, right? My greatest concern for women everywhere, not just Arab women, is is the collective illness, you know, that they may have and that they may in turn pass down to their children, you know, and I've told the story many times and people listening are probably rolling their eyes, but I had this realization and I did this TED talk um, a couple of years ago of how we feel, we as women feel, is actually stored in our DNA, is actually coded in our DNA and is handed down generation after generation. And there's the science to prove it because it's stored in our mitochondrial DNA and that doesn't change from the mother. It keeps going, passing down and passing down without much alteration. So my mother and grandmother had a lot of stories of maybe not full out abuse, but a lot of subjugation, a lot of not being able to express themselves, a lot of brilliant women, beautiful women, right? Who could have probably made a tremendous impact in the world, but just really put down over, over time. My mom actually, her step forward, which no generation had done before was to get divorced. But that was a huge thing for a Muslim woman to get a divorce, right? That's a massive thing. And the whole thing, I divorce you, I divorce you. I lived that, watched my father do that to her over and over again. But, you know, she always had this look in her eye and this look was of insecurity, hesitation, brilliant ideas, but can never act through because of this look in her eye. I come along and I'm brought up in this chaos, but still have a fairly comfortable life with a great education. It took me a long time to be this confident, secure woman, right? For a long time, I also, if you look at some of my older pictures, you'll see that same look. Then we have my daughter, who's now 14, who could not ask for a better life or a better father. He dotes on her. She was basically put on a pedestal, you know, no chaos, no drama, a lot of busyness, but no chaos and drama she's got the same look in her eyes. And it just hit me that like how we feel and what we as a generation of generations of women have gone through, we are passing down over and over again. So to a certain extent, what you're doing, the work you're doing is so critically important because it's not just about 
what you're doing is also about how you're setting the stage for future generations to be able to jump on that and move forward. So again, you know, we're talking, yeah, we're talking about, about Arab about women, we're talking about their story, but the story of shame is a universal story. And it's one that's making women globally sick. And so when it comes to women here, it's a lack of awareness. When it comes to women where you are, it sounds like a lack of opportunity, but the story is very similar. Now, shifting back to Arab women, what, what are the laws that you think need to be changed pretty quickly? What are some of the couple of things that you think just this, this can't go on? I think when it comes to legislation is we need to empower women. And, and that is happening, you know, I mean, people are trying to, you know, you see more women having um, ministerial positions, whether in the Arab world, and that was never really there, and it is happening now. Um, so hopefully these women can also try to, to, to make a shift and, and, and change um, laws and change, um, change mindsets, maybe, change mindsets. But, but one or two of them is basically a citizenship and, and, and abuse and judicial laws and to relook at the judicial laws and to sit down. And um, the other thing that I would really, and you touched upon it, is to sit at home and to have these three discussions with your family, your father. Yeah. Sit down and talk to him and sit down and, and have that happen more often than you think it should. You can't just leave everything till, oh, you know, everything is going to be followed when I pass away and this is what's going to happen. Um, yeah, fine, but maybe you want to discuss certain things. Why not? Why do we always feel ashamed? We need to move faster at a faster pace like our children's generation. You're so right. A happy mother raises confident children, correct? Yeah. I mean, and we give birth to the future generation. So if we're depressed and we have issues, that next generation is going to have a hard time, correct? Correct. And I think as civilizations progress when the woman is empowered, right? Mm -hmm. she, yeah. she sets the tone for education. She sets the tone for cultural values. You know, she sets the tone for leadership. You know, women have a big job. We have a big job. It's not a job to be taken lightly as the okay. center of that family and as the primary child rearing, no matter how supportive your husband is, you know, we are still the driver when it yeah. comes to centering the family. And when that woman's not empowered, like, you know, we go back to my mother, so brilliant, so educated, so many hours wasted crying and being upset and being miserable, like years wasted like that, right? And so I feel like, you know, there are lucky stories like our family where we took it as a determination that we are going to be self-sufficient and nobody's going to tell us what to do. And God forbid, you know, and, and, and I'm a huge advocate for women working. I don't believe because of what I've seen that women should ever be in a position to be that vulnerable within their home or within, you know, any sort of construct. They have to have some voice. And sometimes they don't even have a voice here because they put themselves in a position where, you know, they have given everything up for a family. So I think that's a very dangerous position for any woman to be in. But I think what concerns me about the Arab world is, is how are we progressing? Can women run for office? Can women sit in judicial council? Are women going to law school? You know, what, what are we not seeing that's happening? And then the flip side of that question is how can we help? How can we propel that? Do women like me sitting in other countries need to be a more active participant in what's going on in the Arab world. Women are having, like I said, some ministerial positions, but they're appointed, by the way. They're appointed, you mm -hmm. know, so it's not that she ran for the election and she, you know, she didn't run for elections. Um, some women are running um, for elections in, in certain countries and they are getting their positions. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a minority. It's not a majority, right. nor is it even equal, but they are. So the opportunity is is open more than it ever was before. Maybe the pressure does come have to come from abroad. Maybe that pressure has to come from abroad, and and we should band together as sisterhoods and vice versa. You know, yeah. I think I don't know what platform we can all use. I only have this platform right now that I've decided to, to go ahead with. But I wish we could band together. I my idea of this eventually would be, you know, hopefully a hear us speak a platform where, you know. I wish I could have therapists sitting and helping people, people, women who are abused, people mm -hmm. would talk to lawyers, people would tell them what rights they have. Mm -hmm. Maybe more shelters will open because we don't have many at all. We mm -hmm. really don't have women's, uh, abused women's shelters. We have a sporadic number and that's not enough. We need lawyers to work for them. We need, we, we need them not to feel the shame and we need more lawyers to say, I want to help. And yeah. that will obviously influence the judicial process, you know, when they see this influx of international publicity coming in. I think there's an amazing opportunity 
to bring women around the world together and support one another in countries, even where they may not be getting the full judicial support because changing mm -hmm. laws as we've seen here in the States and as we've seen anywhere takes time and changing culture takes even longer. All we can do individually is continue to educate and touch the people we can touch and influence yeah. culture within our homes, our families, our communities and our platforms. But but I think remember we're always, you know, we're always the sum of our parts. And so as each of these parts come together, I think something really amazing will happen. I think uh, you know, my daughter and I were talking as well and it's time for a reformation, it's time for a change and it's time to to really make an impact here. And so I think that I think that amazing things might come out of this interview today. So I'm hopeful that so. Oh, thank you. Yes, I think, you're I think you're that nice. well Wonderful. No, I, yeah. I hope so. I hope so. I really do. But, but I'll tell you what, one quote, one of my, I, I don't know, I'd like to share this with all of you yes. if you don't mind. One quote, one of the um, women I interviewed, and it stuck with me, and it still in, is in my mind. She was telling me her story of abuse, and she was a wonderful woman, and she was so, so powerful. Her aura was just beautiful. She was full of full of love, if I can say that, after what she's gone through. Um, she was abused heavily and her story's in the book. And when I was writing, when I was interviewing her, I was tearing, I was tearing and I didn't know, you know, and, and I looked at this lady and I was tearing, I'm writing her story and she held my hand and she said, look at me, Susie, I'm fine. Look at me now, I'm fine, don't cry. I'm fine, I threw the anger out. I don't carry anger anymore mm. and I'm, I'm much happier. And she said the quote that, that always makes me think, she guessed, she said, God gives you many keys in life and it's up to you which door you decide to open. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah. And I, it, it's, you know, and it, it, you know, I think about that a lot in my everyday life, you know, yeah. it's up to us to decide, you know, what, what keys do you want to open? The key of depression, the key of I'm angry, I will never forgive this person, you know, this woman was heavily abused and she moved forward and she actually mm. threw it all back. You know, and um, so, so that's I'm telling. I was touched by these women that I met because they were wonderful women. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever they've gone through. Um, so, a woman is very powerful. We underestimate our power. I think, don't we? I think all the time, and that's yeah. why I hope that people watching and listening to the show, you know, are understanding the importance of owning your power. It's not really just about you. It's about this entire family, this unit that many of us are involved in and they depend on us for for owning our power you know so i feel like it's more of not a want but a responsibility a responsibility that we have to ourselves and to each other to help each of us step into that so this has been amazing the book is hear us speak right letters from an arab woman so i'm assuming that's available everywhere the books are sold it's on and Amazon everywhere so wonderful and then your instagram handle is at hear us speak for all of you listening today, if you have ideas, send them to me. Let me know what you think we should do to unite women around the world. I am so passionate about this. I really think it's the motivation behind why I do so much of what I do. And I think it's something that we all need to be thinking about uh, much harder as we move into the future, because as we've seen with the pandemic, the world really is one place. So, so we know that we can't ignore what's happening to our neighbors for sure. And Susie, this is incredible work. Congratulations. You already have an incredible career that we didn't even go too much into, but thank you for taking some time out to enlighten us on all of this and definitely continue to keep us connected on anything that's uh, happening since. And thank you all for watching this episode of Superwoman Wellness. Mm -hmm.